<laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer's Den with me, your host, Jordan, your Master of Lore and Storyteller Extraordinaire. And, uh, feels like I was just sitting down here recording. I wonder why that is. But... I am bringing you the next step of the DM guide, taking a look at different ways of fixing, adjusting, tweaking, and just generally trying to make more fun the D20 modern system. And for today's episode, we are taking a look at redoing weapons, adding certain things in, and adjusting others. And so let's just go ahead and dive right on into this. You already know why I'm doing this, and I just re-explained it too anyway. So before I let myself ramble on into circles, one of the first things we are going to do when it comes to redoing weapons, we're going to take a look at the melee weapons and we're going to add in an arming sword. What's an arming sword? Well, an arming sword is a one-handed bladed weapon coming in a variety of styles featuring a cruciform hilt and either single or double-edged blades. And what this is going to do, it's going to deal 1d8 points of damage. It's going to have a critical range of 19 to 20 times 2 and it weighs 2 pounds, give or take. And some of you might think, wait a minute, that sounds a lot like the longsword. And it basically is. But here's the thing. This is what an arming sword more or less looks like. Like I said, it's got the, cruci it's got the cruciform hilt. It's designed clearly to fit in with a one-handed grip, although you can go two-handed with it. But... An arming sword is definitely designed to be used in one hand and typically is paired with a shield. And the reason for that is, well, I could get into the historic, a lot of historical reasons, but the reason for that is you had armor. You had, you had your gambeson, then you had your chainmail over that and maybe a, a plate, a, a coat of some kind of plates going over it, but you didn't have full on plate mail armor. But as smithing techniques and production techniques improve for making better and better quality steels and better and better quality armors swords also changed and this is what roughly what a long sword is like a long sword is designed you can use it one-handed with how it's balanced but the grip is designed for two hands now this does make it a two-handed sword but it's not a great sword a great sword is another beast entirely and does not use a lot of the same techniques because a great sword kind of bridges that gap between sword and polearm. But I'm getting into a lot of other historical information here, but you can get the idea of just how vastly different these lengths are here. And to me, it seemed like it was a worthwhile thing to add in something to make that distinction. And hence, we add in the arming sword here and place it over top of the longsword statistics. And for the longsword, the longsword gets to be upgraded to 1d10 points of damage and has that 19 to 20 times 2 critical range and weighs about 4 pounds. And this does kind of put it in the spot where bastard swords used to be, but the thing is, is that bastard swords, uh, these terms, arming sword, longsword, bastard sword, uh, these are things that are modern day inventions because we like to categorize things and differentiate between things based on their uh, their appearance and their and their different designs of construction and the like and so uh, way back when in the medieval period the dark ages uh, all the way up through the renaissance people would have just called these things swords you know um, maybe they would have said a two-handed sword hey can't really say 100% for certain, but more than likely, these were just swords. So, with a bastard sword and a long sword, a bastard sword is just slightly longer than most long swords, by maybe a couple of inches. So, you know, it's kind of a toss-up, and so I kind of do away with bastard swords more often than not in my own gameplay. But, I'll leave that, whether or not you make that decision, entirely up to you. But the next step we have here are the Saber, the Scimitar, and the Katana. These deal 1d8 damage, have a critical range of 18 to 20 times 2, and they weigh about 3 pounds each. And the reason why I throw the Katana in there is the Katana does a... It, in the base rule set, it deals 2d6 points of damage. And 
there's really not a lot of reason for that because a katana is basically a saber. It's a two-handed saber, and it's a relatively short weapon for a two-handed weapon. It's not to say it's a bad weapon. It's a fantastic cutting weapon, and it's right up there with the scimitar, the killage, uh, the tulwar, but all of these things have a very similar functionality to them. They're curved cutting blades. Not that you can't thrust with them, but they're definitely optimized and set up to be great cutters. So I feel like all of these can kind of fill that same category, but they're visually, culturally distinct enough and have enough unique differences in their constructions that I think it's worthwhile to list, list all three names here but to keep some very similar statistics. I mean, uh, tollwars typically have that disc at the bottom there, and the purpose of that is it keeps your wrist from bending like this when you cut, so it forces you to keep a straighter, cleaner line as you cut, which helps you cut more effectively. The saber sabers can have, you know, that basket hilt construction to them. Uh, katana d typically does not. They have that smaller round disc pommel, but they're two-handed. I mean, I could go on and on and on. I mean, clearly. And I'm going to stop myself before I go on too much and turn this into a history lesson here. But these are the changes I propose for the katana and putting them in that same generalish category for your curved saber cutting weapons. And also, we're going to change the brass knuckles because brass knuckles only add one point of damage and, and uh, it just... I mean, they crit on a 20 times 2 on their base, so I, I've never liked how brass knuckles were handled. So for this, we changed it to where brass knuckles upgrade the damage dice by one size. So if you're dealing 1d4, you go up to 1d6. If you are already dealing 1d6, you go up to 1d8. And it treats you, it, same rules apply if you're using brass knuckles. Now your melee attacks are dealing late, uh, lethal damage. Well, your unarmed attacks, technically. You're, they're dealing lethal damage now, if you weren't already. And they provide a wider crit range out of 19 to 20 times 2. It's not a big improvement on the critical front, but overall, with the increased dam being able to increase the damage output and that critical range, I think makes a lot of sense for the Brass Knuckles overall. And then, going on from Brass Knuckles, we also are taking a look at changing things up for the Tanta. You still deal 1d4 plus your strength modifier for damage, 20 times 2 on crit, but when you're fighting defensively, if you're using Tanta, you add a plus 2 bonus to your armor class in melee. Doesn't do anything for you against ranged attacks, and if somebody is, starts trying to grapple you, you, you don't get that bonus there, but because with Tanta, if you have them going along your arm, or even if you have it out with, or have them outwards with the, the handle going off to the side there, you can use them to protect yourself quite a bit effectively. They're built very well for being defensive weapons. And also, we're going to throw a battle axe into the mix here. Now, the battle axe is going to deal 1d8 points of damage plus your strength mod, and you also get a 20 times 3 critical hit modifier. And this is going to weigh about 4 pounds. And uh, that's basically the gist of it for the battle axe there. I mean, battle axes, again, like swords, come in a wide variety of options. But, you know, battle axes are not ungodly heavy weapons. They just have a lot of their weight focused at the head because, well, that's the part that's going to be dealing damage. And you want that weight behind it. But to, to add on to all of this, for many of the melee weapons that you could be adding into here, I think it's very useful, and I certainly do it all the time, is using the rules from the Pathfinder uh, rule set is more than sufficient and is compatible enough with the D, well, because it's all the D20 system, to use all of that without really much adjusting. If you feel like you need to tweak or adjust something a little bit, then certainly go ahead and do so. But overall, most of your melee weapons you can easily pull from here. Or if you don't have that, pull it out of the 5th edition book. Or go to, if you, if you have them, your 3rd edition books. Those will work all perfectly fine for this. 
but these are not the only weapons that need to be redone. If there's one thing that D20 Modern definitely gets criticized for a lot, it's the weapon damage for the different firearms out there. And I'm not going to lie, it can't, it's, the, the damage output that you have with firearms was not great for D20 Modern. Adding in things like Pathfinder's Deadly Aim feat certainly will help with this quite a bit. But even then, some of the damage is a little bit skewed because, I mean, two, uh, 22s deal 2d4 points of damage, but so does a 38 in most cases, uh, depending on the firearm. And you'll find weird little things if you have the Weapon Locker book where certain calibers of weapon are dealing differing amounts of damage depending on the gun that they're assigned to and that can make a certain amount of sense when it comes to like going from a pistol cartridge to a full-on rifle cartridge but saying things still get screwy even if you're going from pistol cartridge to pistol cartridge and so but one thing i will add in here i don't think that there's any way to really perfectly emulate the differing amounts of damage that different uh firearm cartridges can do just because there are such a wide variety that perfectly encapsulating and replicating simulating the kinds of damage that these uh that these different weapons can do is going to be more or less impossible without making something overly complicated and clunky so for this here this is just a simple fix and I hesitate to even call it a fix this is just more of an adjustment and I won't go over every single one here because well it's a lot so I'm just going to post the sl uh, slides to the screen here and you just take a look over it all but 22s deal 2d3 38s do 2d4 uh, the difference between the 45 and the 9 millimeter is just that plus two bonus there. And really, that's going to be the big difference between a lot of these different cartridges. Um, the 44 Magnum does 2D8. The 50 caliber ACP does 2D8 plus two. It's definitely significant amounts of, of damage overall. And then we come up to similar things with the, the 556 and the 762 or 308. And yes, the 7.62 and the 308 are different cartridges, but just looking at them through photographs and the like, they are close enough in size that while they are going to have distinct ballistic performances, they're still close enough that I think, at least for the purposes of the game, they're close enough in physical size that this is, should be fine. And, and we top all the way out here at 2d12 points of damage coming up to the 408 millimeter and the 50 caliber rounds all the way around. We come up to 2d12 and then 2d12 plus 2 respectively. But the big distinction actually uh, that I wanted to go over is for shotguns. 12 gauges and 4 gauges. Now these do 48 and 40 10. The reason why I'm giving them such huge damages is well... Let's go over the rules here, and then I'll go over the reason why. For birdshot, after the first range increment, these rounds lose one die of damage each range increment to a middle of minimum of one die of damage, meaning they can go all the way down to 1d8 points of damage uh, once you go out uh, just up to even four range increments. And then for slugs, these rounds lose one die of damage after every two range increments. So up to eight is when it'll take the, for them to go down to uh, uh, one, one die of damage. The reason for this is under the D20 modern rules, a 12 gauge deals 2d8 and a 10 gauge typically deals 2d10. The thing is though, is that, is that the, uh, the AR-15 deals 2d8 and an AK-47 deals 2d10. And most of your 12 gauge weapons only have a magazine of about five, maybe six or seven rounds. And the AR-15, if you're going with a 15 round magazine, well, there's the whole thing right there. You have 15 rounds, more than double or even triple if you only have five shots, what a 12 gauge can do. And if you've got the 30-round magazine, well, hell, 
I mean, you're good to go there. And it de since they deal the same amount of damage, there really is no reason to pick up a shotgun. Because, well, you're dealing the same amount of damage with a higher magazine capacity and no real penalty overall to operating within a close environment. Or at least no benefit from operating within a close environment, which is typically what shotguns are used for. So, to reflect the power that shotguns have in a in close environment, you're going to want, well, you get this extra uh, damage overall, but you're also going to lose damage at longer ranges. Now, again, this doesn't perfectly reflect how uh, firearms work in real life, but I think it is a slightly more accurate portrayal, and it also gives players a reason to switch between weapons. If they're going into a closer area, uh, an area with a lot of close quarters fighting, room to room and the like, clearing houses, a shotgun will provide a significant amount of benefit. Not that so having somebody with an M4 or AK-47 or whatever, not that they won't have their place and use inside of a close quarters environment like that, but shotguns can deal as devastating amount of damage at point-blank range. So that's what I wanted to reflect with this here. But these are not the only things to fix in D20 Modern. Certainly we've gone over stuff for the class abilities, skills, feats, and now we've covered weapons. And there's still just so much more to go and I'm not even sure that I'm going to make it through everything but we're certainly still going to cover a significant no uh, amount of the D20 Modern book. And so with that said, we're going to go ahead and leave things there. And if you like today's video, go on down there and hit that like button. And if you did enjoy this video, then there are going to be a couple popping up over here that you may enjoy as well. And hell, if this hasn't been your first video and you've been enjoying content so far, go on down there, hit that subscribe button, we're, we will certainly be more than happy to have you joining us here at the Gamer's Den. But with that said, I've been your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. Thank you all so very much for your time, and you all have yourselves a good night.